Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namibia, our show where we bring you topics, destinations and some interesting to the point stories. Uh, like I said, those are our three uh, categories as always. My name is Frank Steffen, as you can see on the, on the screen there. I'm the editor of the Allgemeine Zeitung, but I'm also responsible for the Tourismus Namibia magazine. So welcome to this week's show. I hope we've got some interesting stuff. Um, I approached it a bit different, just so that not each show is 100% the same as the previous one. So up next we've got uh, topics and then we'll go forward. Right, uh, welcome back. And um, I, s I know that in most cases our rain has uh, uh, dried up, but I always want to say for the moment now. But nevertheless, um, we still have a very dry country, um, especially in the northwest. These areas didn't have see any rain. And that is exactly why you then suddenly find flash floods. Um, because there's nothing that holds up the water once it starts running down. And typically, if you look at the photo we've got for you, um, you can see here, this was a gentleman that has driven right through Africa. Imagine going through Kenya, ge going through Central Africa, having done it all, having seen it all, and then just to, to underestimate our rivers in, in Namibia. This was up at Pupa. He tried to cross the river and uh, ended up uh, literally losing his car. What a shame. And um, I don't wish it on anybody. And so while we are on floods, this is era. Um, ERA, you can uh, remem remember, it's the Elephant Human Relations Aid, and they brought us these photos. Um, Sylvanus, you can basically take us through them all. Sylv Sylvanus is the one who is helping me out today as a designer and producer. So you, here you can clearly see these huge rains, what they've done and how, how they've covered everything in mud and, and slick and whatever. So this is in Damra land now. So you can imagine if old hands uh, are caught out by the rain. Um, as a visitor, you should surely be uh, watching out. Look at this, it's, it's, it's such a shame because ERA has actually just uh, uh, rebuilt some of their sites and spruced them up. So I suppose they're back to square one just to start again. And here, this is, these are cutouts from their Facebook site. Uh, there you see we dug up the phoenix, <laughs> literally rising from the ashes. This is an old vehicle that they had. Uh, that they tried to recover and um, I have to admit sometimes you wonder whether it was ever worth it but uh, like they say it took 24 men to, to just dug, dig up this old vehicle uh, but apparently it's got a bit of a history so they didn't just want to let it go but imagine for a vehicle to be so deeply under mud uh, that you can't find it uh, you know like they say here one meter thick sand so we just took these cutouts from the video that they uh, put on Facebook. Here you can see Phoenix is finally rising from the ashes, it seems. So um, if, if it happens to them, people believe me, it can happen to all of us. And, and that's why I think it's very important that everybody just realizes if it rains in Namibia, don't take chances. These rivers come down all of a sudden. I saw it when I drove down to, to Lidritz again but I'll post that one on our uh, in internet site or video site, uh, Facebook site in one of these days. Right, and those were our floods and, and all the consequences. Um, up next, we've got a, uh, we want to focus a bit on our desert adapted lines. Um, we've just spoken about ERA, which is obviously the elephant human relations aid. And then we've got the desert adapted lines human relations, DELRA. And uh, they sent us an uh, update this week, and I will be sure to, to convince Isaac Smith to come speak to us on the show in the near future. But these were photos of Inky Munt and other people uh, that found, for example, that uh, hide from, from a lion that died. And, and the, here the, the lion actually still looks, lioness uh, still looks good, but uh, the newest ones show much, much, uh, yeah, haggard and, and, and hungry, obviously. And 
Yeah, clearly you can see these, these animals have a hard time. Now what, what puzzles me is we've been able to, to save our, d our desert horses. Desert horses that, in effect, were only uh, landed down in Lidritz because of Germans. Um, Germans, whatever, their various theories how these uh, uh, horses came about, I suppose it's probably a combination of a couple of them. But the desert adapted line, they are there simply because they adapted to nature. It is a natural phenomena. It's nothing with humans having interfered. The only interference that happens now is that we don't look after them. We take away the game that they feed on. We take away the habitat. We, we, we push them out further and further. And they essentially are now going hungry. And especially with the drought, we spoke about it before on the show, especially because of the drought, it worsened the whole situation. And so the newest assessment that Inky Munt and Isaac Smith have, have sent out now is that the desert lions are down to between 35 and 45 animals. That means the next thing that you will see is in, that they get inbred and they've got other problems. So I think we better get moving very fast and try and help them. So if you want to help, maybe it's a good idea to make contact with the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism because I'm quite sure that they are uh, looking at ways in which they can try and uh, assist in this situation. And then obviously Delra. Delra can be found on any internet uh, site. You just need to Google it. D-E-L-H-R-A. Desert Adapted Lions Human Relation Aid. So um, just have a look about that and, and try and let's try and say these lines. I think they're very important. They're unique to this country. Nowhere in the world to be found again. So those are our topics for today. Up next, we've got destination. Right, so before I delve into destinations, uh, I, I would just like to, to remind you, uh, you saw that uh, advertisement just now, One Up Two. One Up Two is our internet channel, so that's got nothing to do with uh, whatever you otherwise see on Facebook or on, on even on TV channels and so on. One Up Two is our internet-based station where you can have a look at all of the programs of NMH, so not only Tourismus. You can go back into previous editions, you can watch live, you can do whatever you do. This is not restricted to Namibia, it is really worldwide. So if you find that you remember there was a program and you still want to have a look at it again, you're welcome to go to One Up Two, it's the internet channel, and there you can look at any of our programs, including Tourismus Namibia. Right, talking of destinations, uh, this time we want to take you to Swakopmund Craft Market. Now, if you look at the map that we've provided here again, um, the, the craft market is sort of on the right-hand side. And I, I try to include the pier, um, so because uh, Micheline Navati says, she's a colleague of mine in Swakopmund, and she recently visited the craft market that is found near the museum. And you can see here, I've indicated the museum right at the bottom. This is close to the pier that is also known in local lingua as the Mole. So if you look at these photos coming up, you can see there are quite a number of, of nice thingies to buy for yourself. Um, even local guys can support these, and I found this very interesting. Uh, we recently uh, spoke about the Swakopmundt uh, uh, Craft Center. This is very much the same, same type of people. These are people, local people, that are selling uh, well and nicely crafted uh, homemade products, very often from up in the north. And uh, so, so we thought that we'd bring that to you. Um, Micheline spoke to uh, a person he introduces himself as Mr. Jacques. 
And uh, here's the video if you want to have a look. Welcome to Soko Moon Market. We are behind the museum. So these are our products we are selling. And my name is Mr. Jack. Yes. Normally I'll be selling this uh, African art. This with, uh, with necklace. Normally all of this necklace made by bones. Cow bone. So we have also Autriche necklace. This is the bracelet. The Autriche. Uh, we are having also a cat. Small animal. Very funny. Uh, for the moment, our business is very quiet. We don't have any clients. Like before, since uh, the sickness starts all over the world. We are very suffering for the for the tourists. But last year, December, it was a little bit fine. It was fine, we picked up something. But since December until now, very quiet. So by day, maybe we end up nothing, no clients. Sometimes you pick one, you pick two. But no, it's not like before. Before, sometimes you can have 20 customers or 30 customers. And now it's very tough for the moment. But we are still pushing hard and working hard. Normally, tourists they like uh, necklace. We have like uh, this one. This one is a stone called amatite. Mm -hmm. With the tiger stone inside. It's a hard man. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, guys. Yes. Uh, guys, the Valentine is coming. You must come and buy something for your wife. Come and buy something for your wife to surprise her. So this one they go faster because they are easy. Most of the customers like necklace and the bracelet. So that one they go faster in the market. And we have also other products. They go so quickly. We have animal, elephant, buffalo, big five. They go so faster. And you can take the old shop. We have nice buffalo there. Also they go fast. There was a big pipe down there and the African mess. And this one, this one is agate stone. The agate stone is a bracelet made by stone. It's a very beautiful stone. Once you Google it, you find the meaning of this stone. It's a very beautiful stone, it's having a meaning. So find out, it's agate stone. Find out by itself. in the water for sandpaper because to make it smooth to make it smooth so uh, this can this ball they take time to make them so normally we cover them from Okancha is where we used to cover them, sometimes from Rundu at Kavango there, if you have time to go there, you can go, but if you don't have time, you can go to Okanja, it's where many people, they are filtering these uh, Kavango balls. So it's where we, are, we like to produce most of the time, we just bring them here, then we finish them here. So here we don't have the place where we used to make them. Here we just come and finish them, then we put them at the market. So what you is that water or what brown no. substance is that? This is water. This is water we are using to take to take the color out to make it smooth. Oh. So once it's to make it smooth, it come back, it bring this color. 
now we put it come like this ah. yeah come like this then uh, from water before to come like this from water it come like this oh so yeah. that is the before come like this this is the before you see now it's dry then for me we have to put again sandpaper a smooth sandpaper then from there we apply mid brown polish after applying mid, mid brown polish then it come come like this where you can put your salad so that's the final product yes this is the final pro product okay yes and uh, normally with this one this one is natural like this then uh, from there if you want to put design then you put design so you put design this we call it is a batik design inside here and this is the the zebra zebra design and red red and media on it yeah so all the Namibian product from local yes You know, so often we have to listen to arguments about this stuff all coming from South Africa or being brought in from Zimbabwe and I don't know what else we hear. And this is nice to see this is done locally. This is local craft. Obviously not all. Some of it might be pre-manufactured by others as well. But what I love about it is the fact that this is not only stuff that's bought and, and sold to you. Uh, the guy actually sits in and produces it himself and he's proud of what he achieves. So very well done to these guys and thank you Micheline for that contribution. And so while we're in Swakopmund, uh, my colleague Michelle Leroux recently uh, was down there. She's uh, uh, the lead person of NMH events. She's the team leader there. And uh, she sent us the following contribution by the Swakopmund a cappella singers. She came across them when she and another colleague went for a quick coffee, and uh, so this is the result. For our first selection, I encourage all of us here to sing along and dance along. We took it from one of the famous animation movies, The Lion King, Lion's Instrument. So, Singers, and my name is Gino. And uh, sorry, I'm Dennis. I'm a vice leader of the group. Donald, team leader for the group. Um, the Sogomna Capella Singers were started uh, way back in 2010 in, in Riopoc, and later on, we started our second branch in Corejas in 2011. And the third branch, the Sogomna Capella Singers, again, we started here in Sogomun. Um, the group has started an initiative of creating job employment to unemployed male um, to take them out of the streets and so forth. So we are doing this for um, to raise some funds for ourselves because most of the guys in the group are unemployed and this is one of the ways that we are raising funds to like bring bread, bread on the table and um, as, as, as we are also saving up money we are sending some other guys to go study further and so on. Yeah. 
that's the main aim of the group. And um, we're also having a tour this year to Germany, hopefully in the middle of Germany. So it will be our first time to go overseas. So we all support and love and appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and again, it's something different. And once again, I need to remind you, if you want to go to One Up Two, where we have all these various shows of ours, and even if you watch over DSTV channel 285, that is, or 94 on GoTV, um, Namibia Media Holdings, when they created this network television uh, channel, that was one of the undertakings they did was to say, we will be supporting local artists. So um, if this is something that you like and you want to hear, listen to more, then I would suggest that you uh, access one of those channels and uh, that way get some more uh, local music to f for you to enjoy. So up next, we want to talk a bit about Ludwitz. And uh, you, we were obviously down in Ludwitz last week uh, when we attended the uh, Congress of the Hospitality Association of Namibia. And if you look at the map that I've provided here, it was just an overview, just to quickly show you, because right at the bottom, you would see there's a little eye. Um, that's more or less where the, uh, um, the, the airport is, and just below that is Kolmanskoppe. But uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this ma map is I indicated there uh, Diaz Cross and Halifax Island. You can just see the island part there. But what it shows you is that the bay, Ludritz Bucht means bay. Uh, Lidritz Bay and uh, so it is a bit of a bay but the harbour itself is hidden in the smaller part of that additional bay that you see there. That little bluish thing that you see sticking out there that is Shark Island. So Lidritz is like tucked into that bigger bay and uh, so it just gives you an idea, idea where, what area we're looking at. And now we've obviously spoken often about this. Um, you know. Uh, if you look at the following photos, I've, I've accumulated quite a number. It was not so much because we keep talking about Ludritz and then we tell you where you can go and what you can all do about it. And obviously it's the Tsaukite Park and all that sort of thing. But, but there's never time to really show you how many typically old, and I think some of the stuff is actually built in the Jugendstil. By the way, I, I grew up in this uh, building for some time of my uh, youth years. And, but anyway, this used to be the old cinema, for example, in Ludwig. There are many old uh, buildings. This is the old power station. This is where the Hong Congress was. This is the road that leads past the power station over to the Nest Hotel. Um, and in the back, you could see the church uh, steeple checking out there. Um, wherever you go, you always have these old buildings. This is just across from the waterfront, the original waterfront uh, down by the harbor. Um, there's always them. And now these gentlemen here, if we can stick with that photo for a moment, that's on the left ma uh, side, you've got Fluxman Samuel, and then it's the uh, Honorable Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism, Poamba Shifeta, and then on the right hand side, uh, Roger Gertzel of uh, um, DSTV, the, the, the DSTV and the Mobian part that is. Now these guys are standing right in front of these huge black curtains and, and then obviously the presentation was uh, presented on this white screen in the back. And uh, so for the first time now to the public, they actually opened this up. So if we look at the next photos, you, you will see that they're still standing there and now the screen is being rolled up and suddenly you see this uh, nice Ludwitz waterfront. This is now the waterfront inside that conference center inside the old uh, power station. And this is what sort of greeted us. 
Um, this was the site if you looked down from afar. Obviously the other photo was uh, made into the sun there just for the effect, but this is what, what we were able to see. So even if you don't have presentations and it's just a meeting so on, um, this is what you literally look at down towards. And in the backs, uh, you, you can actually see that they are busy building and carrying on and so on. So I continued throughout Ludwitz just making photos. Um, sometimes the stuff is old and dilapidated. I remember that site you had to uh, have a shipyard many years ago. This is the power station as you view it from the side of Nest Hotel. So um, always, this is a little jetty, and I remember this jetty is age old because as a child we used to go and swim here. So I know it from that, uh, from those times. It's obviously old and it, it needs repair, um, but that is what it is. So I went out on the jetty and actually made this photo of the nest hotel because um, this is where the people got together of Han and, and, and sort of met and had a nice evening there on the right hand side. You can't really see it on this photo. They were stacking up wood and they later light, lighted a fire there, as you can see here. So adding to the atmosphere and doing what they did. It's a very nice site um, uh, to, to go to and obviously Nest Hotel we've spoken about before, we've written about it. And the next day we went out and had a look about around Salkite. This is the entrance literally into the park, so we weren't allowed to go in there. Obviously it's only guided to us. But the whole of Lydritz, just the immediate surroundings. Um, this is an old power uh, distribution center down at what used to be M and Z. This is the Goethe House. Uh, Goethe House. Um, it's, it's one of the most well-known sites in, in Lydritz as you go up and then obviously the church. I had to, to do this photo different because you couldn't get it horizontally in, uh, in, in such detail otherwise. So, it's, it's a very old church um, and um, these houses are all nicely made up. Uh, Glück auf is what you can read on, on top of that uh, door. Glück auf is the German expression for miners uh, wishing them good luck. Um, so wherever you go in Lüderitz, you are reminded of these old times. And um, yes, some people might argue with you, but yeah, it's only German and it's prehistoric and it might be colonial times and so on. But it is history. It is who we are, what we are. It's what built us. This is sort of the road going down towards the harbor. Um, I just uh, shows you even your houses. This is once again, this is what we faced when we went to Hun. This was the, the uh, convention or the Congress was held in there as you can see here with our tourismus vehicle. I took this photo simply to show how the angles more or less worked with a, with a church on the left-hand side because it's reflected uh, in, the, in the window. This is the center inside and uh, they will do much more uh, with the center as they go forward. But I just felt I wanted to share it with you what it looks like. At the bottom they gave us an idea of, of the museum because it's a maritime uh, museum that will be built in there and they've got quite a number of thingies in there already. Just have a look at this video that's following this photo. Uh, Sylvanus, is that the video? I'm not quite sure now. Here we
Yeah, and this is, I took a sneak, uh, uh, I sneaked into their museum site that they're busy building up and they had this massive uh, whale that they've suspended in the air. The, from here where I've taken this photo, I'm actually on the third floor already. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a massive thing. Uh, so it's comparable to the dinosaurs you often see in, in these similar museums. These are the sort of uh, uh, backgrounds that they've created there. So this is very artistic and very real. Um, you can see they're, they're preparing to, 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 to give us a real impression of what the, a maritime museum should be and what it should entail. Um, so this is not ready for the, for, the, for the public to visit yet, but I just thought it was quite impressive to just show you what they're busy trying to achieve in Ludritz at the moment with that uh, phase two coming up in the power station. Phase one was the one down at the harbor where you've got restaurants and shopping centers and whatever, or little shops at least. Um, and this one is the old power station, uh, which they will be sprucing up to really uh, serve the public and also the, the visitor to Lidritz to give them a real good idea of what it is all about. And that's why I prepared that video of all those little uh, models and ships and so on, just to give you an idea that even in Lidritz there's a lot going on. We will, on the Tourismus Namobia site in due course, we'll show you a lot more about what's going on on the outside. We also uh, reported on it after coming back from Ludritz. So anyway, that's Ludritz for you. Just to give you an idea of what the town is and what, you, what you're going to if you go to spend time there. Just visiting all those old buildings and walking around time and a uh, town and, 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 and sort of getting involved in what's going on there. That already takes you easily a day quite apart from all the other uh, uh, areas that you can visit and tours that you can take part in, stuff that we spoke about on the show in the past. So, so yeah, those are our destinations for today. Up next, we've got To The Point. Right, as you noticed, and obviously looking at uh, last week's show as well as uh, this one now, we, we were quite impressed with what we saw in Ludritz. Um, it, it was a, a refreshing uh, uh, issue, this whole co Congress, simply because tourism and, uh, I must say, under the leadership of the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism, but certainly with a big, big, big shove and support by the Hospitality Association of Namibia, not least of which is uh, Kita Petzl, the, the CEO. Um, she was actually thanked with a standing ovation uh, during the night of the big uh, gala e event um, by all, and uh, it included the minister. Everybody got up and really thought she did well in the time of COVID to, to, to take this industry and try and find positive angles and promote Namibia to the best of her ability. So while we were down there, obviously you could see just now from the photos, the CEO of the Ludritz Waterfront, uh, Fluxman Samuel, was there. And I asked him to, to just uh, explain to us quickly about what's going on in that area and what they tried to achieve with this revamping of the power station. And this is uh, what was the result. So we're standing here with Mr. Fluxman Samuel. He's the CEO of the Literates Waterfront. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, we're obviously pleased to be here ourselves down in Literates. Uh, tell us quickly a bit more about the waterfront and what the development entails. Yes, oh, thank you very much indeed. The, uh, we are now gathered here at the All Power Station, which uh, represent the second phase development of the Ludris waterfront. So what we're trying to do is to use innovative uh, planning to transform the all power station building into an attractive waterfront space. So in this building, um, 
we are accommodating uh, sports facilities and also um, uh, conference facilities. And then there will be about two restaurants and a coffee shop and the Maritime Museum, which will be a major attraction for visitors. And then there will also be a university. Apart from that, I think it should be noted that between the building and the sea, uh, there will be a promenade, which gives the capacity of the Ludres waterfront and by extension the town to host major outdoor uh, activities of uh, international and national standards. Well, we've seen the auditorium now, but uh, the question is now, how long do you judge this still to carry on before it's finished? Yes, uh, indeed. A project of this magnitude, of course, uh, cannot go without some challenges. So we have gone through uh, one of the major challenges, perhaps, is the, is the funding that we, do, that we do receive from the state. Because the uh, Ludres Waterfront is a, is a, is a public uh, entity owned by the Namibian government. So we have seen for the last five years that money, uh, capital funding for this project has been declining. So uh, we are hoping, we keep our finger crossed for the next financial budget. We have uh, made a good case to, to, to government and uh, they have uh, informed us that uh, they are committed to this project. Hopefully uh, some funding will come our way. Uh, we need about 120 million still to go to finish everything. Yeah. Once we are done with that, uh, once we, we receive that money, I think it will take us about uh, 12 months to complete everything. So. Uh, we believe that by, by uh, early next year we should be able to complete this uh, exciting project. Okay, because that would be obviously be great news because just looking, I'll quickly peek through the window at the museum. That museum is quite extensive already. Is that also publicly financed or is there private enterprise involved as well? The, the Maritime Museum uh, is an integral part of the whole transformation of the building. So it's funded by the state. However, we have some entities, uh, including public entities and private people, who are making uh, donation to the Maritime Museum, okay. which we welcome, uh, uh, to come and add value into the Maritime Museum. And uh, please trust me that uh, this will be one of the major attractions uh, in southern Namibia. And also, of course, it will be the only Maritime Museum in the country. And this will be also the the biggest maritime museum in the country because it will be housed in, on five floors okay. of the building on the northern wing. We have enormous space and we have already artifacts worth um, uh, 15 million on site, which wow. we can allow visitors to, to look at it if they have time as well. Uh, what you see here is just a, is just a fraction. Okay. So some other things are stored here, which we can allow people to see. And, and, and as, before I end, I must also say that uh, museum experts uh, who are also contracted in, in this project uh, to share their, I mean, to, to, to make their, their professional experience, um, uh, to make their professional experience um, uh, part of the project, they have told us that, look, if you are developing a maritime museum, and this maritime museum is in a historical building, such as the old power station, which is more than 100 years, because this building was completed 1911, it's already scoop number one. Yeah. Number two, if you have it close to the sea, a maritime museum is scoop That's number two. Belongs, yeah. So we have both uh, the competitive advantage. Yeah. Now, uh, I grew up here as a child, so I still know this uh, building as a power station. So to me, it's already a huge transformation. Tell me finally, before we part, um, this uh, whole thing about Han having its Congress here, how do you see that in terms of uh, uh, the furthering the literate's cause as a tourist uh, destination? Well, uh, I think the... F firstly, we welcome Han, and uh, of course this Congress has been postponed for almost two times due to COVID situation in the country. Um, we have the best conference facilities in, 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 uh, in this part of, uh, of Namibia, certainly. Just last week, I mean, we, we had a, a full week of conferences of all school principals in the, in the oh, south. Okay. Next week, we are hosting the National uh, Road Safety Council uh, conference. Okay. And in April, um, in April from the 26th, we are hosting the National Youth Week. All the youth in the country come here in the Ludwig uh, uh, space. Yeah. And then we also hosting the Krefi Festival. Of course, this year, we are busy with the restart plan. 
So certainly we, we believe this is a marketing uh, opportunity also to the other players within the industry who are here to see that the Lutus Waterfront is there uh, to complement the initiatives of promoting tourism, especially when we in a, in a period of restarting yeah. the whole tourism initiatives in our country. Well, there you have it. Those were the words of Mr. Fluxman Samuel. He's the CEO of the Lidritz Waterfront. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Right, and that was Fluxman Samuel. He gave us a good idea of what's waiting there. And uh, I think just another reason, hopefully, for, for the government to somewhere in their budget that has just been announced uh, to, to find some money to maybe help Lidritz just to get that final heave over the doorstep and finally be back in the tourism industry in a, in a big way. Because like I said, Zalkaip, uh, the, the Spergebiet uh, uh, park that they've just tried to reintroduce, they announced that they've got five uh, um, concessionaires that are able to access that area now. That's the area from Luderitz going down to, to Runnemund. So very exciting stuff there for Luderitz because I'm quite sure if that is properly done, then over time we will find that uh, um, that area will, will have a good economic upturn again. Right, and then because we missed it last week simply because the program was too full and we were busy doing hun, hun, hun the whole way long, um, there was one thing that I still wanted to highlight in this uh, program as well, and that was uh, a, a talk that Claudia Heiter, my colleague at the Allgemeine Zeitung, had with Kelsey Prediger, who's the founder and director of the Pangolin Conservation and Research Foundation. We've had uh, Kelsey on the show in the past, and uh, what she did, she told us more about the interesting mammal and, and you know, some facts about the current poaching situation in Namibia as regards the, the pangolins. Remember, um, the previous week, so in other words, yesterday, a week ago, it was pangolin day. So have a look at the video. My name is Kelsey Prediger, and I'm the founder and director of the Pangolin Conservation and Research Foundation. I am also the Secretariat of the Namibian Pangolin Working Group, which is chaired by Kenneth Visev of the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism. Could you give us some interesting facts about pangolins itself? Yeah, it's, it's tough to keep it short. <laughs> They're really unique animals. Yeah. They are the only scaly mammal. They are not a reptile or bird. Okay, <laughs> they yeah. give live birth. <laughs> Uh, they are actually over 60 million years old as a species, oh. and there are eight around the world. And they actually have a really long, sticky tongue that's as long as their body. They don't have teeth and they don't have an actual, like, jaw. Um, and their tongue is, uh, has a gland that's sticky, so when they stick their tongue into a nest, they'll, they'll be able to pick up the ants, termites, oh. eggs, and larvae. Uh, what does the situation look like regarding the poaching for the pangolins? Every year pangolins are increasingly being trafficked and poached from the wild. Here in Namibia there are more cases registered annually for pangolins alone than elephant and rhino combined. Uh, we've got about an average of 30 live pangolins confiscated from the trade and roughly about 70 skins or carcasses per year. Yeah, the problem is probably that you would never know how many would really be trafficked. Yeah, yeah. that's the yeah. big problem is that we know what's caught, mm. uh, but because pangolins are so elusive and shy, there's no carcass left behind and there's no accountability as to how many were there to start with. Mm. Whereas when you have an elephant or a rhino, there's a carcass left behind. Mm. So we only know what we're catching at the moment. Does a pangolin have any threats? Do they? Well, pangolins are naturally rarely predated because they're so protective when they curl into a ball. Mm. Um, not much can get to them, but that's what makes them such an easy target for people. So people are the number one threat um, with millions of pangolins uh, trafficked since the last decade. And um, additionally, there's many other threats that people face. Another large threat in southern Africa is electrical fencing. Mm -hmm. Low-line electrical fencing kills pangolins and other small mammals. It's approximately, for every 11 kilometers of electric fencing put up that's low to the ground, it's killing uh, one pangolin per year. Wow. And we've also noticed that the drought and climate change has a very negative impact on pangolins. Uh, one study site in central Namibia found 50% 
of the population to die in the 2018-2019 drought. Wow. So regarding the trafficking, why exactly do people do it? What do they use the scales for? What do they use an the animal for? What? Yeah, pangolins have traditionally been used in Africa for different things such as like sustenance or bush meat. Um, they have different spiritual and medicinal beliefs, but there's never been big pressure on pangolins. As I mentioned, there are, are um, Asian species, and these Asian species have been poached nearly to extinction for use in traditional Chinese medicine, as well as um, they're eaten as a delicacy. Um, so the scales and different body parts are believed to cure different ailments, and now there is a demand for this in Asia as their supplies are dwindling. Um, but in fact, there is no use for the scales. It's just the same as our fingernails. Um, and yeah, there's many different things they believe it to be used for, but there's nothing medicinally proven. Right, and that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you enjoyed what we brought you, the content, um, and we will remain on the, for another week. So have an enjoyable Sunday afternoon and a good week ahead. And I hope we'll see and talk to each other, or at least you will listen to my show in another week's time. Until then, remain healthy, look after yourself. Bye. Mm.